your focus on industrial organizational psychology. Um, I'm going to let you kind of obviously do your introductions, but for those of you that are on here, uh, welcome. And this is Jessica Hosla speaking. <laughs> and I uh, hope you have had a, a good day so far with district-wide training. We definitely want to hear your feedback. And um, if you have questions, please feel free to type in the chat box. We'll monitor that. Um, and or there's a little hand raise option as well. So we'll um, we'll kind of keep an eye on that. But with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Wernick and you can get started. All right. Well, thanks, Jessica. Um, yes. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, listening to me. Um, my name is Brenton Wernick. Um, I'm a professor at USF. Um, uh, and I think IO psychology is really cool. Um, I got into IO psychology when I was in high school, actually taking a, um, AP psych as well. Um, and I found it to be a really exciting topic. Um, I discovered this, the, we were using the Meyer textbook, um, and there was a single sidebar in the end of one of the chapters about industrial organizational psychology. And that just sounded to me like the coolest thing that I'd ever heard of. Um, it was talking about leadership and training and, you know, people at work. And I got really excited by, by this idea, by this topic. Um, industrial organizational psychology is a big old mouthful. And it's an uh, area of psychology that not a lot of people know about. Um, even when I talk to a lot of undergraduate students, um, people who are applying to become graduate students and, and, and earn a master's degree or a PhD in industrial organizational psychology, they often just discover that this field exists when they are starting to explore and think about um, where they might take their career after college. And so, Definitely, there is kind of a lot of room for for this field, this area, to become a lot more widely known, and I think it really should be, because I think it's a um, an area of psychology that appeals to a lot of students, um, especially students who don't have a lot of interest in um, working in mental health care or in counseling, but who are really interested in the idea and the topics of psychology um, and you know how we can use psychology to better understand people um, in their everyday lives. So broadly, we can think about IO psychology as being work psychology. So this is the psychology of people at work, what they're doing at work, how work impacts people's um, psychology, their health, their lives. And so IO uses the principles of psychological science to better understand the way that people behave um, in their work organizations. And this field includes a mix of very basic science. So things like um, how does team development how do you people come together in a group, um, figure out how to work with each other, and then develop a, a way to, to be um, successful um, as a team? Um, how do things like um, someone's personality traits impact the way that they um, approach different types of work tasks and whether they're successful or unsuccessful at them? But there's also a lot of very applied um, activities. So for example, if we want to look at someone's leadership behaviors, are they uh, you know, uh, an effective leader or an ineffective leader? Is there a way that we can train and coach people to be more effective leaders? Um, that's that area of leadership coaching and development and training, that's a huge area of, of IO psychology practice. And so there's a lot of different things that you can do in this um, area of IO psychology that can touch on a lot of really cool and diverse topics. Pretty much any topic that's well covered or discussed or um, a part of the field of psychology broadly, whether it's social or cognitive or personality or even biological psychology, there's um, a lot of applications and kind of workplace um, specific um, investigation and practice of those within IO. And so broadly, we can kind of think of the big concerns of IO psychology as being um, how can we make work more fulfilling and healthier for employees? How can we help people to be more productive and successful at work? Um, and then from the perspective of the employer, how can organizations, um, how can we help them to better understand their employees, to work with them, to um, um, work together to accomplish their goals? And how can we help 
organizations to be sure that they're treating their employees fairly. So how can we ensure that practices in terms of things like hiring and training um, are fair and just, um, not, not discriminatory, those sorts of questions. And I think that we really should be teaching IO psychology when we're teaching intrapsych. Um, this is a, um, a conversation I have with a lot of people who are teaching um, um, introductory psychology at, in high schools, um, in uh, at university settings, in community colleges. I've talked with a lot of different people who are teaching this. And I think that IO psych is a really fun topic to include in various places in um, an intrapsych course. Um, one, because it's just cool. It's fun. Um, there's a lot of really interesting real world applications of psychology in um, in IO. And so we can think a lot about the types of topics and studies and scientific findings that we see through all different sorts of um, areas of psychology. And there's a, a lot of great um, specific applications and examples that we can see of those principles um, within work in IO. So for example, if we're going to talk about um, um, diversity and prejudice and those sorts of um, areas in social psychology, we can look at how does that impact the way that we um, hire people or the way that we interact as um, um, on work teams as a really interesting specific um, place where those ideas can can be um, um, displayed and demonstrated. And, so, and IO psychology is also an area of psychology that's really easy for students to kind of connect to and, and tie back into their lives and come up with examples. And, you know, I have a picture on here of um, you know, some team conflict going on here. Students often have really great personal stories of a, a manager at their job that has um, that was really effective or that they didn't like or they didn't get along with um, or they have stories of when they were working on group projects and they had conflict or, or difficulties that they had to um, work through. And so it's a place where we can look and see and we talk about team development or leadership or motivation and students can really easily see, okay, here, this is how this is applying to my own experiences and to my own, um, into my own um, uh, life um, plans and hopes and dreams. Um, I'll just stop here and pause for a second. If you have any questions or you want to interrupt me, please do so um, at any time. I'm happy to stop and, and elaborate on something or repeat something. So um, feel free to, to bug me. Don't, you know, don't have to wait to the end. Another reason that I think that we really should um, you know, consider teaching IO in an intro psych course um, is because work psychology is a really great career option for students. Um, when I took AP Psych, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I was so excited about um, psychology. I thought it was just um, really fun to kind of learn and discover, you know, what makes people tick? Why are why do people behave and um, act the way that they do? But I knew even then that I was not going to be able to be a clinical psychologist, that I was not um, motivated at all to, to work in a healthcare setting. That just wasn't a good fit for my personality. Um, and so when I was looking through and learning more about psychology and I discovered IO, that really clicked for me. This was a way that I could use psychology and be a part of psychology while kind of focused on um, the you know, parts of people's lives where they spend a lot of time. People spend a lot of time at work and work has a huge impact on people's experience. And I wanted to understand how can we make that better? Um, also, I was really involved in student government when I was in high school. Um, I was uh, on my student senate. I was in um, uh, a lot of uh, youth leadership training and development activities um, in Boy Scouts and things like that. And so when I saw that there was this field of psychology that was all about studying things like leadership and motivation and, um, and, and work attitudes and training, that really appealed to me. That sounded really exciting because that lined up a lot with the types of interests that I had um, when I was in high school and when I was a kid. And the opportunities for um, being an Iowa psychologist are really diverse and really wide. Um, so there's all sorts of um, different types of applied jobs in Iowa psychology in areas like human resource management, in coaching, in training, um, in business consulting, in data analytics. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, and IO psychologists are employed by big companies, by small companies, by nonprofit organizations, in consulting firms, by government agencies, by the military, 
Um, I have um, friends and colleagues that have worked for pretty much any type of organization that um, that I can imagine. I have a friend who um, works at General Mills. I have a friend who um, works for a um, a tiger and other big cat rescue um, and conservation um, nonprofit. Um, I have um, folks that work um, in the State Department um, and in the post office, um, all sorts of different um, organizations, kind of wherever there are people, uh, especially if there's a lot of people, then there's often um, IO psychologists who are being employed to help work on things like training and selection um, and um, surveys, evaluations, um, all sorts of topics like that. Um, and these jobs are, are pretty ubiquitous and they kind of encompass a pretty wide range of training. Um, so a lot of um, IO psychology jobs um, are available with bachelor's degrees, with master's degrees, with PhDs, and you can kind of do a lot of different things depending on, you know, what is your specific training, what is your um, specific um, areas of career interests. And like I've said a few times, IO psychology is a really great field for students who get excited and are interested in psychology, but aren't that motivated by working in a healthcare setting. And so this is another a kind of a different opportunity to be able to focus on coaching, on training, um, on data analysis, on, on those sorts of um, types of research questions. And there's about four different places where I think we can incorporate IO psychology into an introductory psychology course. Um, three of them are as part of um, other units or sections that are often um, already being taught as part of an AP Psych or other intro psych course. And then there's also an opportunity to incorporate IO psychology as its own kind of standalone unit, similar to clinical psychology in terms of talking about that, that field and some of the major questions that it investigates. So we can look at how can we incorporate IO psychology into the um, sections on personality and motivation. We can look at how can we incorporate IO into cognitive um, and ability um, psychology. We can look at how can we incorporate IO into social psychology. And lastly, we can uh, look at some of the ways that we could talk about IO psychology as its own field, as a standalone unit. So as part of uh, personality or motivation, um, we can look at, for example, personality at things like, well, what someone's personality traits say about the types of career they're going to choose. Um, or what type of job they might enjoy, um, or conversely, what type of job they might really hate. Um, we could talk about what type of job they might be good at. You know, how can they, how can we find a job that's going to be a good fit for a person's pers particular personality traits? Um, looking at motivation, we can look at things like goal setting. You know, how do we make an effective goal? You know, what types of goals are more motivating versus less motivating? We can look at things like work design. How do we design jobs so that they are more engaging or motivating and don't make you want to pull your fingernails out? Um, we can also look at things like incentives or justice perceptions, you know, the kind of things that about how do people experience their jobs and how do those impact their motivation? So, for example, um, you're probably familiar with the big five personality traits, the big five being kind of the dominant consensus model of, of um, personality trait psychology, um, the big five being openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism or negative emotionality. In terms of something like personality choice, um, people's big five personality profiles have a really big impact on the types of careers that they are um, drawn to or interested in. So for example, if someone has a personality profile that's marked with um, quite high agreeableness, um, can you see my mouse if I'm moving it around or no? Yes, yeah. we can see it. Great. All right. So if we have uh, someone with the personality profile who's um, quite high on agreeableness, and so that's related to compassion and empathy and concern for other people, um, and comparatively relatively low on extroversion, kind of assertiveness, um, dominance, um, outgoingness, they tend to be um, mo interested and motivated um, in pursuing a career in nursing. Conversely, if we see that someone's personality profile is marked by quite elevated extroversion, so assertiveness, dominance, and relatively low agreeableness, then they tend to be more interested in a career in management or business, um, being something like a CEO or a manager. 
And so people's kind of configuration, their peaks and valleys of their personality profile, kind of what are their, their strengths and their, you know, their relative weaknesses, people tend to find, um, want to find a job that kind of lets them act in a way that is natural to them, that is kind of aligns with their basic natural tendencies. Um, and that then kind of lets them act the way that they would you know, prefer to and um, tends to make them more satisfied, more motivated, more interested in that type of work. You can also look and talk about you know, how do things like the big five traits predict success in different types of work. So for example, here what these charts are showing are the predictive power of each of the big five traits for predicting um, different types of work performance. So for example, we might we can look at technical performance. So this is kind of the core parts of people's jobs, things like you know, being an accountant or the or the engineering that you're doing or teaching performance, kind of whatever is the you know core part of someone's job. The best predictor of, of that type of work amongst the big five is conscientiousness, which is really a quite a um, quite a um, predictive, powerful trait for that. Conversely, if we want to think and talk about teamwork, you know, who is best able to get along with other people and work collaboratively and, and you know, accomplish shared team goals, agreeableness is the best predictor of, of that type of performance. If we look at something like innovation, who is very creative, who comes up with great new ideas, openness is the best predictor of that type of performance. And so this is one of the um, ways that we can take the ideas and principles of trait psychology um, that you talk about um, in personality and then show how it can be applied and used to understand some real world behavior that people are having. In terms of thinking about motivation, uh, goal setting is a really big area of Iowa psychology research and practice. So uh, a lot of the things that we think about in terms of what makes a good goal an effective goal come from Iowa psychology research. Um, so we could ask, for example, what's better? A goal that we just say, do your best, or a goal where we give a specific, you know, high target to fit. Um, you may have um, heard before the acronym SMART goals. So a goal should be specific and measurable. You should be able to track and see, you know, how you accomplish it yet or not. It should be achievable but difficult. It should be um, relevant to your um, overall strategy and values. And it should be time bound. You should have a deadline associated with it. That acronym, that idea, that comes from IO psychology research. Um, the work of um, Locke and Latham, um, who studied, you know, how can we make goals more effective? Is it better to say, do your best, or is it better to set a specific high standard? Um, here, this graph, for example, is from a very um, early study on goals um, with the uh, Weyerhaeuser uh, paper company. And what they were looking at was they, um, the company was um, doing their, in their logging operation, their forestry, where they were um, um, cutting trees to then make into paper. Um, they found that the people that were loading the trucks were not really loading them at all to capacity. They were sending trucks out that were half filled, which you know, wasted a lot of time and fuel and was just not very efficient. And so uh, the company wanted help to figure out, well, how can we get people to fill the trucks up to capacity? And so they did a study where for a couple of weeks, they just monitored and saw, you know, here's our baseline of about 60% capacity was as much as they filled the trucks up. And so there was a lot of empty space, a lot of wasted space. And then they set a really simple goal. They just said, fill every truck to full capacity. They set a specific difficult goal. And then they um, set up a system to show people, you know, what is the capacity of the trucks that are being sent out? Are we getting them full up? Um, to capacity. And they showed that pretty quickly over the course of um, just a few months, the, the truck loaders went from loading trucks at 60% capacity up to above 90 um, and went from you know, a lot of wasted space to almost no wasted space just by setting a, a specific goal and saying, no, here, hit this standard, get up here. And since then, there's been a lot of different types of research in terms of why do goals work, how do goals work, and how can we um, help people to set goals that are going to be more motivating and help them to um, better accomplish their, um, their desires. We can also incorporate IO psychology into the um, units on, co on cognitive psychology. 
So for example, um, one big area of IO psychology research is judgment and decision making. How do people look at information and then make decisions from it? Um, so for example, if I'm a manager hiring an employee, how do I compare different employees' um, applications and decide who to hire? There's a lot of research on how people make those comparisons and ultimately make decisions. Um, there's also a lot of research on how people can interpret data if it's shown to them or how they can misinterpret it. And how can we show data in a way that's more effective, more persuasive, and gives a, a clearer sense of kind of what is the lesson to be learned from it. Um, a lot of time, there's a lot of time that we spend when we teach cognitive psychology on heuristics and biases. And um, there's a lot of really great examples and illustrations of those heuristics and biases in IO psychology um, workplace and looking at workplace decisions. Uh, we can also incorporate um, and talk about um, workplace research on training, learning, and feedback. So how do we design effective training? How can we structure training so that it um, helps people to learn more and to retain more? How do we give helpful feedback? Um, is it better to say good job or is it better to get, point out specific areas of good performance and, and bad performance, um, places where people can improve? And we can also talk about um, the impact of cognitive abilities or intelligence on different types of work outcomes. So things like career choice, work success. Um, probably one of the most successful applications of um, ability measures is looking at using those to predict um, people's performance um, um, when they're applying for different types of jobs. So for example, in terms of something like judgment decision making, there's a lot of research um, in IO psychology on what we call the decoy effect. Um, so here, for example, we have two different candidates who are applying for a job. We have candidate A, who's got a high level of experience, but only an average portfolio that they submitted with their application. Um, conversely, candidate B has, you know, only some experience, not a whole lot, but have a real has a really stellar, really impressive portfolio. And um, if we present these types of profiles that are kind of balanced, and you know, there's no clear candidate that stands out as being particularly better then oftentimes people will have a hard time deciding, you know, should I pick candidate A or candidate B? And um, can experimentally show that if we give people these kind of equally good applicants, they have a hard time making a decision. But if we pair these two with a third applicant that um, here is called the decoy, then that will um, predictably lead people to um, be much more likely to choose candidate A or candidate B. So for example, if we pair um, these two with decoy one, who's got very high experience, but a really poor, really um, bad portfolio that they submitted, then um, the person is much more likely to pick candidate A. And the reason for that is that candidate A and the decoy are similar on experience. They're both high on experience, but candidate A is better than the decoy on the portfolio. And so um, when there's kind of in, difficult to choose between two fairly balanced candidates, if you add some information that gives an easier comparison, so um, the decoy that is similar on one dimension, but then much worse on another, um, that's an easier comparison. So people tend to be drawn to that comparison and then pick candidate A. A because that one's clearly better than the third choice. Um, conversely, if we pair them with um, decoy two, then they're much more likely to choose candidate B because candidate B is comparatively better than the second decoy on, on experience. And so we can um, understand how are people making these types of decisions? What are the different types of cues in their environment that are leading them to make particular choices? And it's not just random. Also thinking about things like measure, um, measures of cognitive abilities um, or intelligence, so we can look at how those impact, for example, um, someone's career choices and career interests. Um, if we think about specific abilities, so is someone you know relatively better at math or relatively better at verbal types types of tests types of abilities? Um, we see that people tend to gravitate towards careers that take advantage of their particular strengths. So if some kind of um, looks at their their profile of of um, abilities and says, "Wow, you know, my particular strength is is verbal. You know, I'm 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 you know I'm a I'm a words person. I'm a verbal person. I like to think in words and ideas. I'm not I'm not much of a math person." 
then they tend to pursue careers in areas like um, the humanities um, or literature or um, arts and entertainment. Whereas if someone um, has a particular strength and is kind of more focused in their abilities on, on math and, and quantitative abilities, then they tend to, those types of people who have a particular strength in that area, they tend to gravitate towards things like um, physics or physical sciences or math or engineering, um, those types of fields. And people who are relatively balanced in their um, profiles of abilities, so they're, they're not particularly stronger in one area versus the other, they tend to pursue things like biology or psychology or education um, or business that kind of have kind of even demands in terms of, you know, um, both things are, are really useful and um, kind of demanded by their jobs. And so people kind of, people's pattern of their specific abilities can have a really strong impact on the types of image or uh, interests they develop and the types of careers that they get, that they feel drawn to. Um, also thinking in terms of um, predicting success at work, um, effective performance, um, we see that in terms of um, applications of measures of intelligence, um, besides their use in um, their diagnostic value, for example, in educational settings to um, identify students with learning disabilities, um, the other major successful application of um, ability measures is looking at predicting who's going to be um, effective um, at, on different types of jobs. So if we look at um, measures of job knowledge or reasoning um, or, or those sorts of skills, we see that those are really good predictors of um, successful performance across all sorts of different types of work. And that predictive power of these um, increases the more complex the types of jobs that we have. So especially if we look at things like, let's say, NASA engineer, um, pe uh, people who score higher on knowledge and reasoning tests um, related to that type of work tend to perform much better at those jobs than people who sco um, score lower on those. And so if we want to look at, you know, who's going to be successful in different types of jobs, or if I'm uh, an organization looking to hire an employee, um, using a measure of, uh, a structured measure of job knowledge or reasoning can be a really effective way to identify who's gonna be um, able to do, to do that job, to learn the, re the required job skills and perform well. Not to say that these, that ability measures predict everything. So for example, um, if we compare looking at misbehavior, so people, you know, uh, are there employees who come into work late very frequently or who steal things or are abusive or do other sorts of behaviors that we wish employees didn't do? Um, we see that ability measures don't really predict those at all. Those are much more driven by um, personality characteristics, by environmental factors. Um, and so if I'm an organization, for example, concerned about something like absenteeism, um, I'm gonna wanna pursue a different sort of strategy to, to address that problem um, versus um, when I, if I want to identify who's going to be you know, best able to acquire the, the knowledge and skills to perform well on the job. Third area that we can incorporate IO psychology is into the social psychology. Um, there's a lot of very social um, type research that happens in I.O. The organizational side of I.O., the O side, um, often we can think about as being applied social psychology. So, for example, a huge area of um, I.O. psychology research, um, especially at USF, is teamwork and team development. Um, looking at how do teams grow and develop to work together, you know, what factors can make teams more effective in terms of their communication and, and collaboration, what factors can cause problems um, and, and can interfere with effective um, teamwork and collaboration. Um, you may, in some of your um, professional development, have encountered something like this model of the stages of team development, uh, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. Um, that's a model that developed out of research looking at team development um, in IO psychology. Some other topics that are um, quite widely studied in organizational psychology are, are diversity. So things like um, what are processes um, and things that lead to discrimination in hiring and promotions. Um, that lead to, for example, exclusion of, of women or members of different racial groups from different types of, of work or different types of careers. Um, that, 
the factors that lead to those processes and those outcomes, those are studied quite a lot um, in IO psychology. Also things like career barriers um, or the impacts of diversity on teams. So how do you know different types of fault lines develop and how can we um, effectively manage and bridge those um, those fault lines to help teams that with a diverse set of members to work more effectively together. Another big area of um, organizational psychology are job attitudes and things like fairness and justice perceptions. So for example, there is a um, a concept called procedural justice that has received quite a lot of attention um, where um, people always, of course, want outcomes that are good for them. So if, you know, they're going to um, be, you know, get paid, they want to get paid more. Or if they're, you know, someone is going to be um, be fired or not or dismissed, they don't want to lose their jobs. You know, they, you know, if there's a layoff, they don't want to to be laid off. But a lot of times people can feel much better about a negative outcome um, if they feel that they were treated fairly and that the procedure was was just. And so if they, for example, if the process that led to a decision was very transparent and clear um, and if it is you know, clearly justified why something happened the way it did and people are treated with respect um, as a person, that can help someone to be much more satisfied and much more okay with an outcome, even if it's not the outcome they would have preferred. And there's a lot of research and, and areas in organizational justice and how um, organizations can, can work with employees and make them feel much more um, respected and, and justified um, in terms of their experiences. And then lastly, we can incorporate IO psychology as a unit unto itself. And this is something I think that, you know, Obviously, we are always struggling to have um, enough time to cover all the topics we want when we're teaching. I, I routinely only get through about half of the stuff that I plan for a class. Um, but I think it's really worth considering spending a couple of days on IO psychology as a topic, um, especially because um, it's such a appealing area of um, psychology career for a lot of students who like psychology and and want to explore the in, in option, uh, different types of ways that they can be involved in psychology um, in their careers. And there's a lot of really cool um, and relevant thing, uh, topics that are really pretty exclusively studied in IO psychology. So for example, a huge area of IO research and practice is leadership. So what makes a good leader? What makes a bad leader? You know, what types of abusive or ineffective leadership behaviors are there? And how do those impact employees, their motivation, their, their performance, their well-being? How can we um, how can we coach people to become better leaders? You know, what are the ways that we can um, help people who are working with um, other employees to do so in a way that is more supportive um, and more beneficial for everyone involved? Um, another area that's a, a really great activity and thing to spend um, some time on in an intro psych class is job analysis. So a big part of IO psychology practice is just thinking about what is work, what types of work are there, what types of tasks are they are there, and what are the characteristics and skills and traits do people need in order to be effective um, at different types of work. And we call that job analysis. And that's a big area of what we do, for example, when an organization wants to hire someone for a job is they think about, okay, well, what exactly is the job? And then what are the qualifications someone needs to do that job well? And um, doing some job analysis activities with students is a great way to do some career exploration and help them to think about, well, what is it that I want to do with my career that I, that I want to do with my life? And we're going to take a look at some resources for that. Um, Another topic and area would be organizational culture and development. So some organizations are really, um, you know, have a really effective culture. So they might be very supportive of their employees or they might be really innovative um, or they might um, have a, a culture of customer service that's, you know, well respected. And then some other organizations have some less savory reputations. They might be perceived as a place where it's not good to work um, or where people are afraid to speak their opinions or there's lots of um, unsafe behavior. And a big, um, another big area of IO practice is um, organizational development and um, going into an organization and, look, and trying to understand and examine what is their culture and then how can we make some changes um, so that the culture becomes more effective or healthier um, to, to meet the person's and the organization's goals. 
And a big area and kind of another uh, less area that I think is really cool and fun to talk about in intro, um, and that is a also a specific area of um, research focus um, at USF, um, both uh, in Tampa as well as um, by the some of the um, IO psychologists who are um, in uh, USF Sarasota Vanity um, is occupational health. So looking at things like stress and burnout and work-life balance and how can we design work and how can we structure work in a way that is healthier for, for people that may, helps them to better manage stress to to um, uh, avoid becoming burnt out to be to be more um, um, satisfied and fulfilled in their work and so for example, um, in the topic in the area of job analysis, we um, one really great resource is ONET. This is um, a um, website that's put together by the Department of Labor. That's a huge repository of job analysis information. And so here for all the different occupations in the US economy, it will say things like what types of tasks does this job do? Um, what are the educational requirements for this job? What are the skills that are necessary? What are the types of interests and personality characteristics that are effective or needed on this job? And this is a really great way um, for um, people to kind of understand how we think about work, but also to, to explore what career options they might pursue. Um, there's a lot of um, career exploration resources that are incorporated here on the ONET website. Um, they have this um, tool called My Next Move, which can help people to look through kind of what are their skills um, and abilities and and talents. Also things like there's um, an interest inventory and a personality inventory that's built into ONET. So you people can take an interest inventory and kind of talk about what things appeal to them at work. And then ONET will match up their results with jobs that fit those sorts of interests and will you know be fulfilling and interesting and motivating to those types of um, to those types of work and, uh, and those interests. And lastly, I just have here um, some resources. Um, SIOP is the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology. That is the major professional organization for IO psychology. And they've um, started to put together um, a bunch of different resources that include you know, some book chapters, some readings, um, some, some lecture materials on different IO topics, as well as a collection of activities for things like looking at um, discrimination, looking at um, job analysis and exploration, um, looking at leadership and goal setting and management, a lot of different activities to, that you can um, you know, pick up and use right away in your teaching. Um, also, the Wikipedia page on IO psychology is really, really quite, quite well done. Um, and so that's a great resource for some general information on IO. Um, the ONET database that we just took a look at. And then lastly, these two links to iopsychology.info um, and then a link on that page to a collection of IO blogs um, are um, a great resources for some um, additional info on the field. That's about all I have. Um, these slides are going to be available for you to, um, to look at and review and you can get access to the links. And so I will, um, you know, Jessica already has those and we'll be able to distribute them to everyone. Um, and now I see we got some questions starting. Um, all right, so uh, Josh asked the question, um, what, what does a typical IO research design look like? Um, there's a lot of different types of research designs um, and that depends a lot on um, exactly kind of what topic are we looking at. So for example, a lot of the team development research happens with lab studies um, that happen in, in university labs, because there we can kind of construct teams and give them different types of tasks and challenges and structures like that. Um, but also a lot of IO research is field research that um, where we go into an organization and look at a process or look at a change that is happening and then study how people respond to that change or how things develop. So for example, we might go into an organization and um, survey or uh, or watch um, people who uh, or when a team is starting to come together, and we can look and see how um, how that team develops over time. Um, so, for example, one of my colleagues um, at at USF here is currently doing a study where they um, were working with 
um, astronauts at NASA who were developing and training for a space mission and had them wear badges that monitored um, who were they nearby, who were they interacting with. And so they gathered this data looking at how are these, when are different people on this team interacting with each other? And they saw a develop, uh, uh, and they were able to see how the team was developing over time, as well as then how some relationships were becoming stronger and some relationships were becoming weaker and having more problems and structures. And so they used that process to understand how is this development happening? Um, one of the big ways that I do research um, is by working with companies um, or other organizations during their hiring process. And so I might develop a personality assessment and then we'll administer it to people as they're applying for the job. And then we follow up and measure their performance later on and see, okay, did this was this assessment uh, a good predictor of who was going to be um, a good performer versus a poor performer, you know, successful versus less successful on the job. <laughs> Um, all right, um, a question about uh, sample personality tests. Um, there's a great one available from 538. Um, I'll grab a link for that. Um, um, generally, uh, if you are using a personality test, um, you want to find one that's designed around the big five personality traits. Um, and there's two kind of key components for, for why that's the case. First is the big five are um, a good general summary of the broad ways that people differ from each other. So if I want to kind of get a, you know, a first impression sort of um, understanding of someone's personality, understanding their stand, their levels on the big five traits is a, it's a pretty good one. You know, are they more outgoing and active and assertive? Um, or are they more reserved and kind of low energy, you know, um, not that engaged. So are they higher or lower in extroversion? Are they a, a nice and pleasant and compassionate person or are they a not so nice, mean, you know, argumentative person? You know, are they high or low on agreeableness? Are they kind of driven and goal oriented and, you know, um, and motivated or are they kind of more unreliable, uh, you know, happy go lucky, you know, just sit back and relax? Are they, you know, high in conscientiousness? Are they low in conscientiousness? Are, do they respond really strongly to stress and negative outcomes or are they more kind of imperturbable and they don't have much very strong reactions to, to negative events? Are they more anxious and depressed or, or not so much? So are they high on negative emotionality or low on it? And then lastly, are they, are they curious? Are they outgoing? Are they creative? Are they, are they engaging? Are they creative? Or are they more um, rigid or traditional or kind of want things to be the same? and not so into new experiences. So are they high or low on openness? And those, those five dimensions are really kind of good summary of the broad ways that people are different. We can talk about a lot more specific and narrow characteristics and tendencies, but if I just want an overall kind of quick snapshot of someone, a, you know, the big five is a good measure of that. And the other thing about the big five model that's gonna be really important is that it's a, tr a dimension or um, trait-based model of personality versus a type-based model. So um, the world's most popular personality test is going to be the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. And that's really popular, but it has a really big problem in that it, puts pe it cuts people into you're either an extrovert or you're an introvert. Um, it kind of puts you into one of those two boxes. And so the MBTI model says everyone fits into one of these 16 neat little boxes. And the problem is, is that people don't really fit into 16 neat little boxes. Um, and when we have a, um, when we are putting someone into, you know, either high on extroversion or you're either extrovert or an introvert, we're kind of drawing this arbitrary line. And you're saying, if you, you know, you must be this extroverted to be an extrovert. And the problem there is if I'm someone who is just above that line, I get treated Exactly the same as someone who's way up here. So, you know, someone who, you know, generally is that pretty outgoing, likes to talk to people, you know, but sometimes wants to be by themselves, um, you know, isn't the most um, headstrong person in the group, is going to be exactly the same as the person who goes out and dances on tables and, you know, is the life of the party and, you know, always gets their way. And that person is treated completely different than the person who is just below the line, who is maybe just a little bit less outgoing. But otherwise, it's really quite similar. And so 
it's much better to think about personality traits as being a profile. So you're kind of higher or in the middle or lower on characteristics. And a really good resource for learning about the big five and for measuring it is right here. Um, 538, which is a, um, a news organization, um, did some interviews with um, Oliver John and Christopher Soto, who are two um, prominent personality psychologists, and worked with them to develop a fast 30-question um, um, measure of the Big Five um, that gives some really cool visual feedback um, and, and information. Um, and so I really recommend this site um, and this test as a, as a quick um, personality assessment um, that can give some really nice feedback for students as they're thinking about their personalities and, and um, exploring with them. Another good one is from the SAPA group. And this one includes both a measure of um, personality as well as a measure of um, uh, cognitive ability. And then there's also a bunch of other um, good educational resources on different types of personality assessments and, and different types of personality models. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for uh, having me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here with us. That was really interesting. I'm going to share. Are you guys hearing yep. like an echo? Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to share those other links that you shared with teachers. I'll email that to them also so they have it in their email as well. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. And, and if there's anything that um, uh, I or my colleagues in IO and at USF can do to, to help you um, in your teaching of psychology, um, please let us know. Um, we'd be really excited um, and happy to help. All right. Thank you.